Alhamdulillah. I want to set a scene for you. And then I want to teach two lessons and that's it. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave us prophecies of the end of time. Telling us to watch these things before the end comes, before the hour. There are many of them, but tonight I just want to start as my skeleton this hadith that he sallallahu alayhi wasallam mentioned to Auf ibn Malik and then on this build my case and my lessons. So the Prophet told Auf ibn Malik and the hadith is in Bukhari. He said, U'dud sittam bayna yaday as-sa'a. Watch, count, look out for six things before the hour comes. Six signs. I just want to say at the outset, I will not be able to cover the six points. I am touching on one mainly. So the first one he said, Mawti, my death, as in the death of the Rasul, as a sign of the Day of Judgment. So the Prophet ﷺ passed away. The second sign he told Auf ibn Malik about, he said, Fathu thumma, thumma, Fathu bayt al And then the conquest of Jerusalem. And the hadith for those that understand, and our dear Sheikh is here, uh, Allah increase him in goodness, Ya Rab. For those that understand, every part of it is a miracle. You see, the Prophet didn't say, Mawti wa fathu bayt al maqdis He didn't say, my death and the conquest of Jerusalem. He specified a sequence. Mawti, meaning I will die first. Then the conquest of Jerusalem will come. Had this were to have happened before the death of the Rasul, prophethood could have been questioned. Miracle, do you see? Thumma fathu bayt al maqdis So bayt al maqdis was conquered in the 12th year, if memory serves me correctly, of Hijrah in the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu Then the third sign he gave, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, ثُمَّ الْمَوَتَانْ يَأْخُذُ فِيكُمْ كَقُعَاصِ الْغَنَمِ Then an extensive death, like a plague or a pandemic. مَوَتَانْ As in the superlative. يَأْخُذُ فِيكُمْ It will take from you, as in you will die, like livestock die when they are infected. So livestock, I don't think you guys have much access to it here because in the farmlands where there's thousands of sheep, a disease comes, you look at them again and they're all on their backs. Fast, rapid, death just burns through like wildfire. So in the 18th year after Hijrah, so Bayt al-Maqdis has happened. And now in the same vicinity in Bilad al-Sham, near Bayt al-Maqdis, there is a locality called Amwas or Amawas. In that evidence of a sickness became apparent. A plague that used to infect and then quickly kill. And then a few days later, some weeks later, it subsided. It looked like it had gone away. Around this time, this time is not going to work. Uh, Sheikh and I tell them, I'll pay for minutes if they increase the time. So, at this time, Umar ibn al-Khattab who resides in Medina, is making his way to Bilad al-Sham, to Bayt al-Maqdis, around the area 
where the plague had started but then subsided. When he reached a land near Tabuk, the generals of the Muslim army who were in Bilad al-Sham, who were in the Levant, who were in the uh, you know, uh, Bayt al-Maqdis area, came out to meet the Khalifa. And as they're meeting him, news arrived that a pandemic has started. The virus is spreading, people are falling. Now what to do? Does Umar continue? Does he go back? What should he do? So he consulted with the elders of the Ansar. And they were half and half. Some said, no Khalifa, Amir al-Mu'mineen, return back. And others said, no, keep going. And then he consulted with the Muhajirun. Should I go or should I stay? Some said stay, some said go. Then he consulted with the elders of Quraysh, as in those that looked after the affairs of Mecca. What should we do? Wise, astute diplomats, they said, no, ya Amir al muminin return back. Because your welfare is the welfare of the state. So Umar ibn al-Khattab decided to turn back. To turn back. And as he's made the decision, one of the greatest of the Ashab, this is Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah, the Amin of the Ummah of the Ashari Mubashara. He says, Ya Amir al are you running away from the decree of Allah? So Umar said, no, we are moving from one decree to another decree. Like if a shepherd goes into a valley, there's green grass here and dry grass there, and he opts for the green. Both are the qadr of Allah, and he's opting for this over that. Around this time, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf comes. What is the discussion? They said this. He said, I have knowledge of this. The Prophet said in a hadith, that if a pandemic becomes evident in a land, if you're outside it, don't enter it. If you're in it, don't leave it. So Umar ibn al-Khattab became happy that his ideas is reaffirmed by the hadith. He went back to Medina and the generals and their army went back to Jerusalem and back to Bilad al-Sham. Now, as Umar reaches Medina, Umar was very information data dependent. So he used to want daily reports. So daily reports used to come. This much person has died. And once he realized, he realized Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah and the leaders of the Sahaba are in danger. So Umar writes a letter to Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah saying, Ya Amin al-Ummah, O Ya Aba Ubaidah ibn Jarrah, when my letter comes to you, before it leaves your hand, as in before you put it down, mount on a camel and come to me, because I need to discuss with you a matter that can't be done without you. You see, Umar, Eyed two people for succession planning. Two people to take the reins of Khilafat after him. One was Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah, and the other one was Khalid ibn al Walid. And he used to say, I will give the reins to Abu Ubaidah, and then in the court of Allah, I will say, The Prophet said, Every nation has someone that is its custodian. The custodian of this Ummah is Abu Ubaidah. So, Ya Rab, I return the Amana to do its custodian. And to Khalid ibn al Walid, he used to say that the Prophet called him the sword of Allah. And in it is the honor of Islam, and therefore, if I give it to him, then the honor of Islam is, per, uh, you know, saved. So now he's very keen on saving Abu Ubaidah because the welfare of a nation lies on it. And Abu Ubaidah read the letter and he said, That looks like the Khalifa is trying to save my life. So he apologized for the disobedience and asked for permission to stay with his men. 
When Umar saw the letter, he cried till his beard started to drench with, with, with tears. So, sent another letter. In the letter he said, when this letter comes, Abu Ubaidah, command the population in yourself and go up to the hills so that there's more ventilation and that the, you know, it's not a stagnant place where there's no air so that the virus can reduce its effect. Abu Ubaidah got the letter, told Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, make preparations, put his foot on this, uh, you know, stirrups to climb up and it looked like it had got him. Abu Musa went home. By the time he reached home, his wife was infected. By the time he came back, infection had affected him too. He talked to the people a little bit and then passed away. And the leadership fell to Mu'adh ibn Jabal. I'm building a scene. Mu'adh ibn Jabal called the people into the masjid and gave the speech. O oh people, this is the decree of your Lord, the dua of your prophet, and the death of your righteous. And Ya Rab, don't deprive Mu'adh and the family of Mu'adh from this. You see, the dua of the prophet, because the Prophet وسلم, informed the Ummah that martyrs of my Ummah are not only those that die in battlefield, but the one that dies in a pandemic is a martyr. So Mu'adh knows that this is the dua of your Prophet. And the death of your righteous as in Abu Ubaidah died in this and Abu Musa al-Ash'ari died in this. This is not a, some kind of stigma. And then ask for it himself and they say as he walked off the pulpit, he was infected. By the time he reached home, he was barely making it. His son saw him and recited the verse, Oh dad, stand firm. So the dad said, Satajiduni insha'Allah min al-sabirin. You will find me of those who will bear this patiently. And then soon, soon afterwards, uh, Mu'adh ibn Jabal passed away. The leadership went to Amr ibn al-As. Umar ibn al-Khattab told him, Ya Amr, look into this matter. So he says, فَنَظَرْتُ فِيهِ I looked at it and I realized that the virus swaps in centers of population with human contact. So he commanded, everyone leave the cities, go out into the mountains until each person is by himself and there's no contact and wait further instructions. And when that happened, uh, Sometimes later, a little while later, the news of death stopped and then uh, the pandemic had disappeared. So why do I say this to you, dear ones? To establish the following. Notice that a very difficult period came, very intense, some 25,000 people died. But I want you to look at the disposition of the Muslim. He doesn't fret it, he's not panicking, He's not anxious. He's not running away back to Medina. The Khalifa is calling him, come to Medina. And he says, no. So I'm asking you, <clears throat> what is it that gave them the ability to bear this calamity? The simple answer is a short word called Iman. They believed in the next life. They believed in what the Prophet told them about reward. They believed in, you know, what was to come. So this looked small to them. Dear ones, this is my first point to you. And probably my only one because my time will run out. Your Iman is your biggest asset, your greatest treasure, your dearest thing. You will know its worth and weight in the Akhirah. The Prophet Wasallam told us that when judgment is passed, a man will be destined, decreed, judged to go to hell. So going to hell, Allah Rabbul Izzah asks him, My servant, my servant, if today you had the earth and what was in it, would you give it up to ransom yourself from this? 
to save yourself from the fire? He says, yes, Ya Rabb. So Allah Rabbul Izzah says, but I asked you for something much less than this, and that is not to disbelieve in me and associate partners with me. Do you see, dear ones, that if you have the earth and what is in it, as in its gold and its silver and its diamonds and jewels and oils and palaces and mansions and its pomp and glory, all of it you would ransom for a bit of Iman. Do you see the value of Iman, dear ones? The Quran says, Inna al-lazina kafaru, law anna lahum ma fi al-ard jami'an wa mithlahu ma'ahu liyaftadu bihi min azab yawm al-qiyamati ma tuqbil minhum. In the day of judgment, the, dis, the, the blasphemer would wish to give whatever is on the earth of goodness just to save himself from the azab and Allah says it won't be accepted from him. Do you understand the value of Iman? Now my point is, dear ones, we live in a time in which Iman is being eaten into, in which Iman is deteriorating, in which Iman is being attacked. And the Prophet ﷺ warned us of this time. This is why it's my topic. He says, بَادِرُوا بِالْأَعْمَالِ فِتَنًا كَقِطْعِ اللَّيْلِ الْمُظْلِمِ Exert yourselves in good deeds for fear of trials and tribulations. The type that you will wake up a believer and by the time nightfall comes, you become a disbeliever. And you will sleep a believer, you'll wake up a disbeliever. What the Prophet says will happen. Muslims, what the Prophet says will happen. A time will come where belief will be shaky like that. Wisdom demands that you ensure that it doesn't or you delay it or you take precautions that you don't fall into. There was a time where I hadn't heard of a person leaving faith. My eyes have now seen people leave faith. And they don't leave it because they have a great logical argument. I swear this to you, there is no great logical argument against Islam. There's no great logical argument for atheism. Whether Dickens and Mickens and Chickens say whatever, there's no logical great argument against the oneness of the Dhul Arsh al Majid. So, what they do, whether willingly or unwillingly, wittingly or unwittingly, they deteriorate Iman through mockery. You see, most human decisions are not logical decisions, they're emotional decisions, most of them. Like you look at the shoes you bought, you haven't bought it because it was the most functional shoes. You bought it because you saw an advertisement, it played with your emotions and then you're stuck with it. You go shopping, no, like this is studied strategies. You go shopping to the shopping centers, look for where Coca-Cola is. The strategy of Coca-Cola, the agreement they make with shopping centers, is that their bottles must be kept at eye level for maximum exposure. It must be kept at the beginning or end of an aisle, preferably the beginning. Why? So you walk past that way, you see it, you walk past that way, you see it, and then you remember a couple of advertisements, and then you end up taking Coca-Cola instead of the vegetables you came for. Uh, it's called an impulse buy, emotional decision. So what they do <clears throat> is they emotionally manipulate. And a tactic is comedy. They've given it this nice name, so therefore you're not allowed to point the finger at it. But mockery, joking, ridicule takes from the, takes from the status of a concept. So these days, you watch, you watch TV, you watch programs, there's a lot of jokes about God. You know, Bazinga. 
You know Bazinga? What's that TV program called? The Big Bang Theory, right? One of its biggest heroes is a person that doesn't believe in God. So, and it shows he's very intelligent, very sharp, and he makes mockery of religion and makes mockery of this, and you sit there giggling. Emotionally being manipulated at a little bite size at a time. All of a sudden, what was a red line now becomes a black line. The black line becomes a gray line. The gray line becomes ah, no line. So Allah Rabbul Izza knew your psychology. And that is why, look at this as a, as a warning to you. Like Allah knows, Jalla Subhana, that you will not leave faith because some great logical argument will happen. Your faith will be weakened by jokes and by manipulation and emotional trickery and so on. So Allah Rabbul Izza says, that we decreed upon you in the book. And إِذَا سَمِعْتُمْ إِذَا سَمِعْتُمْ آيَاتِ اللَّهِ يُكْفَرُ بِهَا وَيُسْتَهْزَأُ بِهَا فَلَا تَقْعُدُوا مَعَهُمْ When you hear the verses of Allah Rabbul Izza, the signs of the deen being mocked and blasphemed, don't sit in that gathering. Look at the adab of the Quran. It hasn't told you to chuck a tantrum and this and that. It says, keep your sensitivity, your red line intact. When you're in a gathering and they mock the values of deen, leave that gathering. It will show them you don't appreciate it. It will reinforce to you your own values and keep a barrier between you and the slope and the slippery slope. And then another verse, Allah Rabbul Izzah says, when you tell them, they say, Kunna nakhudu wa nal'ab, Qul abillahi wa ayatihi wa rasoolihi kuntum tastahzi'oon, la ta'atadhiru, qad kafartum ba'da imanikum. Some people were sitting mocking uh, the religion and mocking the prophet and mocking the companions. So when it was reported to the Rasul, they said we were only mucking around. So Allah reveals mocking with Allah and the signs of God and the prophet. Don't make excuses. You have disbelieved and this kufr is ikhrajun min al millah. Like you're required to say the nut of shahadatain to enter it. Why? Because it is such a dangerous concept and Allah knows your psyche that he put this barrier in front of it so that a Muslim is not manipulated into this and that this door shuts. So dear ones, 24 seconds to go. And I promised you two points, but it looks like it will be one. When you go back home, you will find sometimes cousins, uncles of Muslim persuasion make jokes about matters of deen. Leave the room. Seriousness will enter their hearts. It will become stronger into your heart. If you're in a university setup, someone does it, look serious, look stern, polite, stand, walk out, say no. You're in a work setup, Get up, walk out. And if you lose a job, good. Because the hadith says they will give up their iman for a piece of the dunya. Same hadith. So don't. And be protective of your iman, dear ones. Because one of the challenges that is starting now and by the hadith will only accelerate is this people starting to lose faith. The reason you lose it, remember my words and let it ring in your head. Not because you're smarter than the ones that came before you because you're not. But 
Because you're more manipulated emotionally than the ones that be came before you, Allah guide you, Allah guard you, Allah protect you, Allah honor you, Allah reward you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.